Sorry about that. You're now being recorded, everyone. Thank you. All right, so uh, the first thing we were gonna talk about, um, we had a new mechanic that we were working with uh, kickoffs. Um, I think in the spring, some crews were experimenting with it, but not every crew did it. Um, they brought it to the board. They said it was working well, and they decided that everybody's going to use this new mechanic this year. Uh, so it's important we go over that since a lot of us might not have ever done it. They may not understand exactly what's going on with it. So uh, it's basically um, the national mechanic, which we had never used before, and now we are using it. Um, so for the flanks, um, what the headlinesman all these years he's used to be, he's been lining up on the 50 yard line the the R restraining line um, headlinesman now will be starting on the 30 yard line and the line judge is on the R restraining line which he used to be on the 40 with the kickers and now he is on the 50 uh, so we're not just covering the two kicking lines one of us is on the 30 which could give us a lot different uh, look than we're used to. So the back um, judge is going to present the ball to the um, uh, kicker and then is going to leave the center of the field now and run off and position himself at the sideline um, uh, to have the kicker's restraining line. So that's the back judge's component. Right. And then I guess we could also just uh, point out if anybody didn't know that the referee he's not on a pylon anymore he's somewhere in the middle of the end zone and the umpire is not on a pylon he's um out at the is it the 20 yard line he's at the 20 and the referee yeah. is on the end line because the ball can't go into the end so end zone the so goal we line. put him on the end on the goal line, goal line right. the referee shades a little bit toward the um head linesman side because he's down at the 30 um, the umpire being at the 20 um, has a little better look to help with the pylon. So um, it is expected that the head linesman and the line judge on kicks that go into the pylon area and are going to be close to out of bounds or in the end zone. We want to know if you saw that the ball went out of bounds prior to the pylon. Uh, but the referee is the one who has primary call. You have support. Right. So um, we still count the same way we used to. The headlinesman still counts the receiving team with the referee. And the line judge still counts the kicking team with the back judge and signals to them. Um, so what if there's a penalty um, and the kicking lines get uh, moved, then the line judge would move uh, the exact same distance as whatever the penalty was. So he was still on the restraining team's line. Um, but if the line is moved forward or backwards, the headlinesman, it, it seems like he has a little more leeway, right, Steve? He doesn't really have to move exactly 10 yards up or down. He can just Correct. move, uh, he can move up or down a little bit to make sure he still has a good look at the action he needs to see. If it's a five yard penalty, you're pretty much going to go five yards and make your adjustments the same. If it's a 15 yard penalty and it's against the receiving team. So the K is now kicking off from the R45. I'm saying this right. Yep. Um, so now you don't want to be down at the 10 yard line, you know, so um, you can make that adjustment just like Zach said. So the, and the reason that we want the, um, the H down in that area is he's really more stationary and he's in a position to see that strike zone where the two teams come together without having to be running downfield with his eyes bouncing all over the place to cover that action, right? So he's right there where he needs to be. And uh, once the ball is kicked, he really might not have to move at all to view that action um, that is his to judge. It, it's the expectation that they don't have to move and that the umpire is the same situation. They're off the field. They've got a nice little cushion with that sideline and they're just using their eyes. Uh, we still have our initial keys to make sure they don't get held immediately or something, a low block immediately. But really, as Zach says, our focus is waiting for them to come down and, and all collide in that contact zone, which is between the 20 and 35 yard line. So if that's where they tend to meet between the 20 and 35, and we have the headlinesman at the 30 and the umpire at the 20, 
we're in perfect position. We're right there. Right. Um, my other thought is, um, wh what would we do on if we knew an onside kick was coming? We were always used to be ready for an onside kick on any play. We'd be holding our bean bags and our hands just in case there was an onside kick. Um, so how is the headlinesman covering a an onside kick now? If he didn't see it coming, he's not even up there on the 50 yard line. So the line judge is really more worried about that surprise onside kick and being ready to, to rule on whether that ball's gone 10 yards or not, right? And, and yeah, you're correct. And we do have one team, Patrick Henry, which onside kicks every, every time they kick off, they attempt an onside kick. So we should go into our uh, uh, short free kick mechanics, onside kick mechanics um, for Patrick Henry every time they kick. We should never be in this um, formation for, for a team that never does kick deep. So if they kick deep, we'll cover it. But, um, but the, the surprise onside kick, we're not in the right position. Again, every free kick formation, there's you're giving up something. So we're giving up somebody on each, uh, an additional person uh, down there in that um, surprise onside kick area. Um, let's see. I'm looking at checking my, I'm not seeing my chat room. Where are we? Chat. Oh, well. I see there's one about pop-up kicks. I think we're still just going to let the back judge be primary on the pop-up kick, right? He's the one on the kicking team line. Actually, it's, um, it's going to be the line judge okay. because he has very his, – his restraining line really isn't threatened. There's, there's really – unless it's a planned onside kick, right, anticipated on short free kick, the line judge is really just keeps his guys behind the line and they don't threaten it. They're going to drop back. So the line judge needs to be looking for that pop-up kick. He's the least threatened of all the officials. Obviously the back judge has it as well. Okay. Um, um, we're going to, then... we're going to be looking at um, pop-up kicks, um, the huddle kick where everybody's in a huddle and runs forward and they ground the ball forward. Um, and we're going to talk about uh, illegal blocks or legal blocks on free kicks, um, especially on side kicks uh, in our video this coming week. So we don't want to spend a lot of time on those rules tonight. We'll, we'll get into that next week. Okay. And um, when I was talking with Steve, he, he mentioned that, probably the thing we miss the most on these is block below the waist. And we all know on a kickoff, there can be no blocking below the waist. So just a reminder to always be aware of that. Um, and if you're the headlinesman on the 30, hopefully you have a real good look at that now. So we, uh, we don't miss these anymore. Okay. Pre-snap. Pre-snap. Um, all right, um, I put a bullet in there. Make sure you follow some sort of a pre-snap routine. Um, I don't think we need to go over what to put in that. There's a nice long list in the mechanics manual you can look at and and uh, figure out your pre-snap routine. But make sure you go over something, think about it ahead of time, and do it every snap so that you're ready to work uh, each snap uh, the best you can. Um, uh, when the receivers come out and you're giving your upfield foot to them to help them get aligned, um, I always stick my foot out, uh, tap my leg, and just wait for the guys to line up. Hopefully they know what they're doing. Um, if they look at me, I never want to say you're off or you're on because uh, that's just off and on sounds so similar. It could just confuse them. And then obviously we never want to tell them to move forward or move backward because uh, who knows what the coach told them and we confuse them and then we're moving them and we then have to throw a flag for the action we caused being illegal. Um, so what I usually do is just when they look at me, I just nod at them. Um, if they look at me, I want to give them something, but like I said, I don't want to tell them they're off or on and I don't want to tell them to move. And I've just found personally, if I just nod at them, you know, we're going to, we're going to make our judgments anyway, whether they're on or off the line. Um, 
and we always try to make that formation legal, right? Um, I think Cooper's pounded this into us over the years. Um, find a stagger, find a blade of grass. We don't want to have two, you know, a doubles formation. We've got two wide receivers out there and we make one of the guys covered up. If we can at all avoid that, we never really want to have um, illegal formations in that case, unless they're trying to do something sneaky where they have a tight end and they're covering him up and trying to deceive, then maybe it's a little different. But in general, we like to say to make the formations legal. Um, and that sub I put there, what I do, a little tip, I don't know if it helps anybody else. You know, like I said, I've got my one foot out and I'm telling him where he's going to line up. And we know that they have to, after they, after they shift, they have to get set for one full second. So what I do, as soon as they stop moving, I go 1001 and then I move my other foot forward. And for me, that helps it. So anytime my two feet are forward, if the snap goes off, I know they were set for one second. I don't have to think about it. If the snap goes off and I still have one foot out in front of the other, then I know that I never saw that shift come to an end. Um, so that's just something I do every play. All right. Um, I like that. I like that. Um, as you said, if, if, a, if the offense is doing something that is attempting to confuse um, and it is, um, uh, they're trying to cover up and the defense is confused, then I would uh, confer with my uh, referee and my other flank to find out what's going on and why I have guys being covered up and what are they trying to do and trying to make that formation legal. But if it comes right down to it and you can't, then you need to, then you have to warn or penalize after the warning um, and, and, and get them cleaned up that way. So warn, you know, you, you warn the kid, warn the coach, and then you penalize. So it usually that usually that you can clean it, clean it up. Zach, do you in college have receivers who come to you and use their arm to point forward, meaning I'm on the line or put point their arm backward, meaning that I'm off the line? Yeah, a lot of receivers do that, yeah. Okay, so if that trickles into the high schools, you'll know what they're communicating to you. When they point their arm down to the ground and forward, they're indicating to you that I'm on the line. And then, as Zach said, he'll just nod to confirm with the, ref the receiver that, yeah, you're, you're on, you're good. And then you don't say anything, but you can nod. And I used to do that all the time. And then when he points back and he's back, then again, he's going to look at you. He's going to have his arm back, and you're going to go. You're going to nod that I got my four in the backfield. We're good. Um, the next one I was going to talk. Um, we always want to know what the line to gain is, and it seems obvious. Uh, it should be part of our pre-snap routine. Um, when I was first on high school cruise, I had a hard time with this. Uh, I had a an umpire that would always come up to me in timeouts and say, "What's the line to gain?" And I never knew the answer. <laughs> and that helped, that helped pound into my head how important that was. Um, and I had to figure out a way to, to, to teach myself how I could always know this. Um, so the, the way I do it, and again, it's my stupid thing, maybe it'll help somebody. Um, when I move the chains down, every time I move the chains down, I yell two numbers at them, which is the numbers I want them to set up on. Um, so we always try to start the, the series on a line, right? So let's say the, they return a kick and they were down at the 22. So when I say first down chains, first down chains, 22, 32, 22, 32. And when they come by me, I say, you're on the 22, you're on the 32, right? And that, I mean, one, it tells them where I want them to line up. But I just found for myself, if I say 22, 32 out loud three times when the chains move, it doesn't matter if we have four plays and a holding foul and we repeat it down and we lose it down. I just always have in my head that we're going from the 22 to the 32. And I know that that's what it is because I just repeat it over and over again. And then we move and we get a first down and then we're 45, 45, 45, 45. And then that sticks in my head. And we get down to the, this is the really, line. this is really important. And this is, if you don't take anything away from this and you don't do something to know the line to gain, it will pay dividends in your officiating because 
if you know 22 32 and you know the 32 is the line to gain and there's a pass and a run and he falls down right near the 32 you know you've got to make a decision on whether that player made the line to gain or did not you don't have to turn around and look at the chains you know it's the 32 and you have to decide is he short or did he make it and if you put it that damn thing right on the 32 and the referee comes up and says oh damn we got to measure this um you know well actually if he made the 32 you would you would be it would be a first down but you get what I'm saying. You should be able to use that information to determine whether or not um, you're going to give an award a first down or not without referencing the chains. Yep, exactly right. Um, just like you said, if it's 32, you know, when, when we're getting progress, I always stay in my head. You look down at 34. So I don't even have to turn around. I, I just know I'm going to be coming up like this instead of like this because we have a first down. And then you know, even if we have to move the chains back to where they were for some reason, I, I will just, I'll still remember 2232 after I've repeated to myself several times. So um, just something I do for pre-snap awareness. Um, somebody mentioned, uh, can I get that information to the coaches so they can start implementing it? I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about the receivers indicating whether they're on or off. And I will start mentioning that to coaches. Absolutely. Okay. And, um, Spencer Hoffelder did a math thing. He said, and if you're crossing midfield with the chains, the numbers must equal 90. <laughs> yeah, 45, you, 45, 42, 48. Yep. That's great. Never, ever heard that before. Unbelievable. Great. Thank you. All right, so guess we want to talk about a scrimmage play um, and what are we looking for on a play towards us versus a play against us or away from us sorry um, Hold on. there you go right so um, we still use our what do you call it run zone coverage zones right our run zones yep so we know if uh, we're working the line of scrimmage and the play is coming towards us we're in zone one, uh, we're watching in front of the runner. And uh, if our runner's not threatened or the least, the less threatened he is, the more out in front we wanna try to watch and make sure there's no holding in front of him. The more threatened he becomes, you know, we have to watch him closer, make sure he doesn't get face masked, make sure he doesn't fumble. And then obviously eventually we gotta get the progress spot. Um, if the play is going away from us, um, remember we still need to help out with progress. Um, so we need to be aware of where the runner is and if we need to do a cross field. But since we're now in the zone four, we're actually watching more behind the play and we have a much wider area we have to cover. So we're gonna have wider vision and we might be the only person that can see a, a late hit or a, a unnecessary roughness back there behind when everybody else is watching the runner go. Um, you might save the crew by picking that up. Now, if we have, let me go over that again and add to it. Zone one, it's coming to your, your direction. Um, we do snap tackle back. And so now the back has the ball or the quarterback's running in your direction. And this thing is coming wide to you. <clears throat> and so if you're threatened, you're going to fade back into the offensive backfield. Um, you're not in a hurry, but you're going to slide back a little bit. And if there's no threat to the running to the runner, um, then your eyes can be on that tackle on the near side. But the primary responsibility for that edge block, that that tackle or tight end block, is the umpire if he's on your side or the referee if he's on your side. Whoever the, between those two, referee or umpire, they have zone two, which is that edge block, and they have positioned themselves, the umpire a little wider and a little deeper so he can see that without really having to move that much to see it. So um, in an ideal world, your running back is coming at you and you have an opportunity to look at that tackle or tight end and then know that your umpire or your referee is looking at him as well. So we got nice coverage there. Um, 
And then um, the opposite person, the umpire or referee who's not on your side has zone three. So he's got, they've got the herd, the people that are left behind. So when you're in zone four, all of this stuff is moving away from you. So zone four increases. The number of people in zone four starts relatively small. And then as it goes across, the referee is going to transition. The umpire is going to transition across as the play gets to the other side. And now that leaves more and more from the herd who are in zone four. So it is, it does shift a little bit. Um, yeah, but the onus on the flank official at the near side isn't only on him on that wide, that wide sweep. Cool. Um, so, uh, yeah, this seems obvious. We need to have an accurate progress box. We all know that. That's our bread and butter. You know, we're the line of scrimmage officials. We get progress all game long. Um, the one thing that I usually hear Cooper say at a game is that we're not giving them enough progress. We have a tendency to short them. So just make sure you give them everything they earn is what Cooper always repeats over and over again. Um, like we said before, we want to use a cross field mechanic whenever we need to. So um, even if I'm that wide guy looking across the field, I want to know a spot. I want to be prepared if my partner needs that to have that spot so we can get an accurate spot. Um, once we do come up with a spot, we want to make sure that both guys come in on the same yard line. We want to mirror spots. We don't want to have two guys coming in on different lines, confusing the umpire where to spot the ball or the teams, you know, which guys got the spot. So however we work it out, we want to make sure if we're getting that cross field, you come up and, and match the guy that gave you that spot. Or if it's not a cross field thing and we are just disagreeing on a spot, you know, don't be so bold that you can't, uh, you know, yield to your partner's uh, decision if he might have gotten a better look at it. Um, I know we all line of scrimmage guys and it's our spot and we want to get it right. But in the end, we got to come together and agree on a spot at some point. Um, help your umpire out. Um, keep that spot. Hold it until he gets the, the ball down or at least acknowledges you and, and then he has the spot. Don't run away too quick. Um, anything else about spots? Steve? No, I'm watching the NFL just to keep you guys current. In my observation, I haven't talked to Tim about this, is they're starting to get a little less permissive with their spots in the NFL. And um, I know from Michael Carey working with Walt um, Anderson that Walt was very proud of his ability to get accurate spots. And I'm wondering if his new leadership at the NFL level, they're starting to really scrutinize spots now. So the best way to do that is um, on your crew is to use the whole crew when you're not sure of a spot. And did I get the right spot or not? So sometimes uh, your crew chief is going to ask you, hey, pick a couple plays that you want to look at. And we might want a offside or a, maybe a holding call or something, but sneak in a spot, a play with a spot and, and get, you know, umpires are really good at it. Um, uh, back judges used to be flanks, so they're good at it. Your referee is obviously going to be good at it and um, take pride in your spots. And I always, you know, as Zach said, I always say, if you're, if you in high school level, if you, if you think it was here, it's probably just a little bit farther uh, for that guy and uh, be a, just a little bit generous with the, with your spot and then go from there. But <laughs> you, the goal is accuracy. The goal is accuracy. And then the, there's a, a trick that Tim uses to say that he could get spots anywhere on the field. Um, do you remember him talking about that, Zach? <clears throat> no. He would say, he would say, look, when I see a guy down, there's two big stripes. So he's somewhere between the two big stripes, right? So is he on one half or the other half of the middle of the, or is he in the middle? If he's not in the middle, then he is beyond the middle. So now you have two and a half yards. And if you pick the middle of that, the most you could be off is one yard. So 
it's kind of an interesting way to at least have a ballpark on a spot that's downfield that you're struggling to get to. And um, hopefully the back judge has got a spot for you. Um, but you should have an idea that it was either on the forward half of the two and a half yards or the, the nearer half of that five yard stripe. And then within that stripe, if you go to the middle of it, you're probably going to be a yard one way or the other. Tim Pedraza. Okay, so um, we talked about running plays a little bit. What about pass plays? Um, so we're the line of scrimmage guys. Uh, we're going to be watching receivers. We're going to watch the outside guys on our side as our initial primary key, right? Um, if we know it's a long pass situation, we'll be focused on those receivers uh, probably more than other situations. Uh, we still have to be aware if uh, the back uh, fires out, we have, might have to pick up a guy underneath because there's only five of us working. Um, so uh, just know who you should be watching on your pass plays. Um, we need to know on every pass, whether it's a forward or a backward pass and whether it's beyond or behind the line of scrimmage. So uh, as Hoslett has pounded into our heads over and over again, anytime there's a pass on the field, you should say in your head, forward, beyond, if it's a long pass downfield or forward, behind, if it's a short screen pass behind the line of scrimmage or tell yourself backward. Um, our mechanic is, for us as line of scrimmage guys, if it if the pass is thrown away from you and it's in the backfield, you're gonna judge if that's a forward or a backward pass, right? Uh, so what you wanna do, especially if it's a quick pass thrown out, you probably wanna take a step or two into the backfield so you can get a good look at it. And then you're gonna signal either forward or backward punch which way you have it, right? And then if you're the guy that the pass is coming towards, look across the field to see what your partner is ruling. Um, and you can mirror it um, so that everybody knows what it is. Um, but we want to make sure we have a ruling, whether that's forward or backward on every pass. So one of the things, this is a recommended, it doesn't mean that you have to do it, but it comes from, I think the first time I heard it was John in, um, Isham. And then and now I'm seeing it all the time at the collegiate level and NFL level, when that quick pass is going away from you, the flank official, as Zach said, slides a couple steps to the backfield. One, to get a, 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 a more accurate look at that pass going away from you. And secondly, now you've broken yourself away from the chains a little bit in the box. And now you're a little more visible to the official across the field. So you kind of accomplish two things. One, you're more visible. Number two, you have a better look at that. And um, as a um, opposite flank official, you have to get, if the ball is coming toward me, you got to get in the habit of making a judgment and then looking across the field to confirm, right? So it, I, is that the order that you do it, Zach? Yeah. You make your judgment first because the ball's coming so quickly. I think that was forward. Then you look across the field and there's your buddy pointing that it was forward and you're good to go um, or backward. You think it's backwards, so you're going to let it go. You look across the field, and if he's pointing forward, then you have to take that information and make a decision on what to do. You're probably going to, unless you're absolutely sure it was backwards, you're going to kill it incomplete. Um, so there's, it's important that you work as a team. Yep. And oh, vision, um, vision patterns on pass plays. Um, there's a lot of talk now about receivers that are threatened and receivers that are not threatened. Can you talk about that a little bit at the, at the snap? Um, well, definitely at the snap, if he's pressed, uh, you got to focus on him a lot more. Um, there's potential for, they like to jam him in the face and just try to throw him off their routes or whatever. Um, uh, I think the college rule book even changed to, to make more fouls out of that kind of action. Um, so it's a problem at that level. And like you said, it, it can definitely trickle down. So if your guy is pressed, you got to focus on him a lot more 
and see that action right at the snap. Obviously, if there's a big cushion, um, you probably don't need to go to him quite so much. You could uh, help out with the tackle longer, make sure there's not some holding in the backfield, um, and then switch your vision to your guy when he's more threatened downfield probably. Excellent. And, and, and that's exactly what I would hope everyone would do, is if that guy's pressed, there's a chance, higher chance, that they're in man coverage. So he's going to come up, he's going to be man-to-man, -man, press coverage, and he's going to run with that guy. Well, you've got a, you've got potential holding, you've got, you know, uh, grab of the face mask, and then you have, you know, they, they could throw a quick nine route, a little fade route. Now you've got a judge uh, defensive pass interference. So you're consumed right from the snap, right from the snap. But when they're in off coverage, well, there's nothing happening until they get to one another. So he's just going to be, if you're just watching him run around, maybe you could be watching that tackle. Yep. And um, obviously we will uh, need to rule on the receivers being inbounds or out of bounds. And this is a great chance for us to communicate with our back judge when we need to. Um, we like to watch the feet and then the ball. Obviously, we, if his if his feet are out of bounds, it doesn't matter if he catches it or not. It's going to be incomplete. Um, and just something we want to communicate with the back judge. Look at each other. Make sure we have the same thing and communicate so we can get it right. Remember when also with receivers in bounds and out of bounds on their routes. Um, when in question, the receiver was forced out of bounds. That's our philosophy. When in question and they're running together and they end up, uh, the receiver ends up stepping out of bounds, if there's contact between that uh, defensive back and that receiver, then we're assuming he was pushed out of bounds. He did not go out uh, voluntarily. Okay. So we would not have a foul. Okay. All right. Let's talk about coaches. Coaches. All right. We love our coaches. Um, we got to have good co coach communication. We all know that. Um, it's nice when we have a back judge because he can help us with that. You know, he goes sideline to sideline and can help explain fouls sometimes. But uh, being a line of scrimmage guy, we're going to be on the sideline there. We're going to actually do most of the communicating in, in a four man game. We're probably going to do all of it. And um, I know as a, as a crew chief, uh, it really is make or break the game how your flanks communicate with the coaches. If, if you have a situation where the commu communication is just not there and that coach comes over to you and just says, this guy is not talking to me, I'm not getting what I need, it, it really throws off the referee and it's just, it hurts the whole crew. So it's, it's critically important that we can talk to our coaches. Um, so start before the game. I'm sure we all do this. We go say hi to the coach, but just be as, as friendly as you can introduce yourself, start out on the right foot. Some of us have some coaches we have history with or something. We want to let all that go. We want to come in fresh and clean and, and be ready to communicate in any game we get. Um, we know we want to be approachable. Um, the coaches, if they have questions for us, we always want to answer any question they have. Um, and yes, sometimes coaches want to just yell at us and we just have to be okay with that because sometimes that's what we're there to do is to let the coach vent at us a little bit. And we're all right with it, no big deal. We continue and work the game the best we can. Um, I said, uh, try to give them the information before they even ask for it. This is something that I've found um, really impressive as a coach. Um, situations like, um, let's say we all had to come together on the field and talk about something. Well, obviously when you go back to the sideline, the coach is gonna wanna, gonna wanna know what we were talking about. So before he comes yelling at you, what, what was, what were you guys talking about? You know, if you could just come to him and be like, oh coach, we, we just wanted to check the clock was correct. You know, given that information. Okay, great, thanks. Or, you know, before he even asks what happened on that pass interference, if you're just already telling him, hey, it was a hook and turn, the back judge saw 23, I don't know, made early contact, whatever it is. Um, the more information you can give to them, the better, obviously. And, and like I was saying, when I was referee, the two or three times I got the best reviews from coaches 
even losing coaches. It wasn't because we made the best holding calls or pass interference calls. They would call Hoover and tell them that crew really communicated with me and I really got all the information I needed in that game. And that always made me very happy as a referee that my flanks were doing that for me. So just something to not, not shy away from, don't break down and, and not want to talk to coaches. Just be ready to give them all the information you can at any time. Remember, there's opportunities throughout the game where you can give him information um, that is not, you know, it's not um, uh, controversial. It's just game information and you can help him. So um, I would say, you know, when I go to the, to the sideline, coach, we're ready to go. Um, that was at, coming out of a timeout or coming after a, after a kickoff or after a touchdown PAT coach. Okay. We're ready to go. Here we go. You know, just, you know, coach, you got two timeouts left or at a critical time at the end of the half or the end of the game, coach, that's all for them. They have no more timeouts. Okay, great. I want, you know, great. Or a coach will be coming to you. He'll, you'll see him walking at you. And if you can beat him to the punch and you go, coach, they're out of timeouts. And then he, and he goes, okay, that's what, you know, you're reading his mind. You know what he needs, what kind of information he needs. That's, that's like A+. Plus. That's when Zach gets the, the call that says, these guys really communicated with me. The other is if, you, if, you, if you're looking at a sweep, remember that sweep we were talking about, and that tackle or tight end block, and you start here, holding, he's holding, he's holding. I used to turn to the coach and say, who were you talking about? It was the tight end. Coach, I was watching the tight end. I deem the action legal. Oh, I can't believe that. But it's over because he knows I was looking at it. It's not like I wasn't looking at it. So if you can somehow communicate with a coach, now sometimes he'll say, no, it was the center. And I say, oh, I wasn't watching the center on that play, but I'll watch him now. Something, start coming up with things that you can say that are honest and are, are factual. Coach, I judge the action to be legal. I judge the block to be legal. I viewed the block. I saw it. I viewed it as legal. Now he's going to have the final say, but that's the way it is. Um, but when they're just yelling holding, I have to turn around and say, you know, you're just yelling holding. Who are you talking about? And then hopefully they give you more information. And then you can say, you know, that's really helpful. Um, I'll watch for that. Or let me share that to the other guy as well. They used to ask me questions on penalty enforcements when I was a headlinesman. I hate to admit this, but the truth is I didn't know what the hell the penalty enforcement was. Not a clue. Not a clue. But I would run into the field before O2Os and say, I don't know, just a second. Let me go find out. And I'd run out to the middle of the field and go, Zach, what was the penalty? Why are we going from here? Because it was a foul by the offense behind the basic spot. And I could remember that. I didn't know what in the hell it meant because I was a first year official, but I could run back out to the sideline and repeat it and say, it goes from the spot of the foul. Oh, okay. Cause he doesn't know either. He's, he doesn't know the rules. I don't know the rules. So whatever Zach said, that's it. We're going with that. So I just repeat it. So anyway, come up with things to say and then dead ball, you know, it's like, um, you know, I don't, I didn't chat a lot with coaches. I, I just felt like they, they misquote me. They take it the wrong way. They want to be mad at me anyway. So I didn't really, but I made sure my nonverbal was pleasant and professional. I never scowled. I didn't, I tried to stay, you know, neutral and um, friendly Coover. I just want to be loved. <laughs> Okay, go ahead. Do you want to go down to crew communication? Yeah, let's move it along. All right, here we go. Um, That's two, two sections, and we're yeah. just about done. Um, yeah, so, uh, and just like code communication, we all know that's important. We, we know we have to uh, have great crew communication. Everybody uses radios now. Uh, 
I don't know if everybody loves the radios. I love the radios. I hate any game I have to work without radios or when the radios go out for a half. I hate that. Uh, it just helps us communicate all kinds of stuff, um, file information, and is that guy, did you have him off the line or on the line? And to the umpire, can you help me move the tackles up? You know, all, we all know there's a lot of different things we can, we can use those for. Um, and again, I think the mechanics manual has a lot of suggestions on it. So just make sure you know how the crew wants to use the radios because it, it can vary from crew to crew. Some crews talk nonstop every play and, and some hardly talk at all. So just make sure you figure out what you want to say on that and what you don't. And it may change throughout the season. Maybe your, your referee wanted you to tell him five will get you one every single time that happened. And then maybe after you did that 50 times, he didn't like it anymore. And he wants to just go back to the hand signals. So um, something that may evolve over the season. Um, so the line of scrimmage signals, when we used to point back, I got my guy back, I got two back, I see you. I think we were just saying that's optional now. So a lot of crews might not be doing that. Um, I'm saying I'm seeing the majority are still doing it. Okay. Um, and then if there's any confusion, they get on the radio and clean it up uh, after the play. But I'm watching, I would say the majority are still using signaling because they, they want to know what, where are my four? I want to get my four, you know, got men in the backfield. And if I'm, you know, I don't want them guessing at my guy. I guess that's why they're doing it. I don't know. You have to ask them. Yeah. And I like the signals too. So I would use them if it was up to me. Um, but what I don't want is like a distraction. Um, just make sure you know if you're both going to use it or not, because I don't want to be going like this and this guy's not pointing at me. And then I miss a false start because he's not using the signals and I am. So just make sure you know what you're doing there. Uh, for that game. Mm -hmm. um, uh, another thing, when we have multiple flags down um, and, and I threw a flag on the same action that the back judge did, and I'm like, okay, he has DPI. I just assume we both have the same thing. Definitely not. We want to make sure we come together and talk about it. What did you have? What did you see? Definitely confirm that it was the same player and the same uh, foul that you both had because a lot of times it's actually not. You might have two completely different things and you didn't even know. You just assume because you saw something big and decided to flag it that he must have seen the same thing. Um, just make sure you come together and talk about that. And just to review, if we have, if I'm the only one with a false start on my sideline, I can run in, blow my whistle, throw my flag, blow my whistle, and then do a preliminary signal to the referee because I've got the call. But if the other flank and I and or the umpire throw two or three of us throw then no preliminary signals we have to go in and talk yep um and this is what i see a lot um you, you know you want to make sure your referee knows how he wants the penalties reported um but then you really have to do it because even at higher levels at college levels i see we we do all this talking before the game okay i want i want you to tell me holding offense 72 and tell me the result of the play and we all say we're going to do that and then as soon as the game comes in the guy just runs in yells holding 72 and runs away and it's like we just talked about this why do we why do we always forget as soon as our feet hit the grass that you know what we talked about so just take the 10 seconds and tell the referee exactly what happened the way he told you to and it will save it can save a potentially really bad thing. Like that example, you know, a game I had where holding 54, I think, and the, the referee starts to go march it off because he thought, oh, holding 54, it's an offensive holding. It's going to be first and 20. No, it's, now it's a defensive holding. Wait, oh, well, you didn't tell me that, you know? Um, so just make sure you do report the penalty exactly the same way every time. Like I said, if you take 10 seconds, nobody's going to think you're being too slow. You can still get the penalty. Uh, marched off uh, in a good tempo that your uh, observer at the game is not going to think you're going too slow and you won't make a big mistake, which will be what the observer does, does notice and not like, even worse. Uh, I always like, rough. if I could, I always like to lead off with the result of the play. So if I'm reporting to Zach, I go, Zach, we, we had a completed pass out of bounds at the 20. After the play, we have a personal foul on the defense, number 12. 
Well, he's good. It's no thought at all. He's going to the result of the play, and he's going to go and penalize either whatever the yardage is, you know, half the distance or the full amount. Um, on a kick, you know, Zach, on the return, holding number 18 on the return team. Good. We're good to go. That's all he needs to know because it was a running play on the return. But now if it's PSK, I would have to say during the kick, we had a foul by R um, at, for holding. And um, so now he's going to have to process PSK. Okay. So, but that's Zach. Don't worry about it. If you tell him what the play was, where in the play it happened, the number and the team and the result of the play, there your referee will take care of it. You're good. Okay. Practice. Um, and then we're talking about penalties. You know, we're the line of scrimmage officials. Uh, we march off penalties and we confirm. Uh, so we are, you know, very important to making sure it's done correctly. Um, and that can be making sure that the umpire doesn't march five yards on a 10 yard penalty or 10 yards on a 15 yard penalty, but also making sure that you don't go from one side of the big line to the other side of the big line, which actually happened to me in a game this spring and we end up with a 12 yard holding penalty. Um, so, you know, we always say that the uh, penalty enforcement is a crew job and we all have to make sure we get it right. But I mean, we're the line of scrimmage guys. We're the ones going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten yards and putting the ball down. Um, so we just can't mess that up. Take the time, make sure you're doing it right. We all know we're gonna make sure with the umpire and we know how far we're going and figure out for you what works better because I've gone back and forth, whether you're gonna say we're on the 32 and we're going 15 yards, do you wanna do the math? Some people like that better or are you the guy that's gonna say we're two ticks behind this line. So I'm gonna go three lines and make sure I'm two ticks this way. Whatever works better for you. I don't think one is better than the other. Whichever one you're less likely to mess up, uh, go with that so that we don't mess it up. Yep. Okay, situational awareness. All right, uh, wrap it up. Um, we know uh, situational awareness is very important in our football games. Um, the different scenarios that are going on in any game could cause very different things that how we need to handle the game. You know, if it's two very clean teams and everybody's playing well together, it's, it's nice. Um, but a lot of times we know these uh, young men get a little angry. They may not like each other. They may have bad blood and you can sense that rising tension and we need to be aware of that so that we're getting in there more. Um, obviously, um, the umpire in the middle is big on that, but we as flanks need to know that too. After plays, if we need to close in a little extra hard, um, keep our head up, uh, make sure we're watching that dead ball action, talk to the players more, you know, let them know that we're watching them, try to calm them down and just prevent any problems we can uh, in a tense situation. Always a good thing. Yeah, there, there's a, a, an introduction to the game, you know, opening kickoff, opening series by one team, and then the, a kick, a punt, scrimmage kick, and then the other team's opening series. Both defenses have been out there, both offenses have been out there, and then they're instantly starting to be, be tired. So the tempo changes at that point. There he is. How you so, doing? Um, hold on, I gotta mute somebody here. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, so once a team gets out of that initial phase and the fatigue factor sets in, now the game tempo has established itself. It slows down and now it's rolling along. And as a referee and as a flank head linesman with your chain crew, you've got the game tempo, whether you're managing it or not, hopefully you're managing it well and you're ready to go. You, the referee, the umpire, all in sync and you're moving the game along. The opposite happens with players. Players come out and they, you know, they, they may behave themselves right away. But then at the point of the game goes along, 
Now they're not liking themselves so each other so well. And then you have an opportunity to use humor or get talk to the players or warn players or penalize players uh, before it starts to escalate. So you have a lot of tools, but be aware of what's going on with your game. Okay, timeout situations. Yeah, I threw that one in there. I mean, we, we all write down the timeouts, I know. Um, and at the end of the game, we are at the timeout to do two, three, um, but just make sure uh, you pay attention to that. Um, I have had a situation in a college game where I told the coach he had the wrong number of timeouts left and it's, it's just an embarrassing thing to get wrong and really pisses him off. So uh, make sure you're not telling him that he has two and the other guy has three when it's the opposite, you know, make sure. And if you're not sure, don't guess, look at your card or confirm with the crew before you tell them the wrong information. Um, if we uh, are going into a hurry up, um, that's a, a situation we should be aware of, right? I mean, some teams want to be hurry up the entire game and that's going to kind of affect how we work that game. But also any team at the end of a half or at the end of the game, if they've only got a couple of minutes to go down and score, um, that's something we need to be aware of, be ready to work at you know a little bit faster pace, but we don't want to go so fast that we mess anything up. Um, for us line of scrimmage guys specifically, um, we want to move our chains as fast as we can. We want to get in position as fast as we can. We want to be ready to work the snap as fast as we can. One thing I personally don't want to get rushed at is uh, the ball relay. Um, if you've worked game with me, I have, have had a past history of not being the best ball thrower. And so that's one scenario where I don't want to rush. I want to get the ball a nice throw to the umpire. Um, so know your limitations and know what you can can rush up and what you can't. I don't want to throw the ball over the umpire's head and have the clock run out when the team was trying to snap it and get a, a spike so they can take a last second field goal or something like that. Um, and then the opposite of that is a blowout game. Um, that's going to be a very different scenario, right? If it's 42 to nothing in the second quarter, um, we kind of worked out a little differently. Um, we, we maybe don't call a foul as often or as we might in another situation. And we just want to try to keep the clock running as much as we can to, to get out of there and, and let the game end with no trouble. Um, so just another situational awareness, uh, something to be aware of at the end of the game if it's a totally different situation than the, the last minute potential overtime situation. Okay, a couple of the uh, um, comments. Cameras Never Lie by Donald Clay. Um, I don't know what he was referring to, maybe um, uh, spots. Um, but um, don't be afraid of the huddle. Embrace it. If it shows something um, that you um, may have done uh, incorrectly, just learn from it and move on. There's no recourse uh, against... Um, against you. We're not going to sanction anybody. We're not going to punish anyone. Um, we're just always trying to get better. Uh, the less you're sure, closer is better. Safety, safely. I don't know what that means. Um, Paul, are you on? Kwiatkowski. Yes, that was about spots. So if you're not clear on a spot, go in and find the ball. Oh, okay. Yeah. Close in, close in until you see it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's times on like a, a quarterback sneak where you see the pile moving, but you can't see the ball. So you really don't know where it is. You're just following the pile. And then, you know, you just close in until you can find the ball and it's stopped and you got to, you know, kill the play and then find the ball. Um, cameras never use the same angle as the flanks. Be careful with camera angles. Yeah, if the camera angle is behind it, it tends to make the yard line go forward. And if the camera angle is um, on the other side, it, it moves the ball the other direction. Um, so you really, if you can't tell from the camera angle, just just say you can't tell. It's not verified. Call stands. So we say in the replay, uh, the call in the field stands. Uh, remember, when in doubt, incomplete pass. If you can't. If you can't judge it to be a complete pass, it's an incomplete pass. Great. Uh, what if you're meeting on the field and you're identifying the coach is 
Should we tell him that before we ask? Okay, Bob, thank you very much. Um, great advice there. Talk to head coach. Um, what was the most controversial situation that you encountered and how did you handle it? Zach, can you think of one? Well, the one that, that I talked about in the spring when we marched off 12 yards on a 10 yard holding, that was the worst one we had recently. There was nothing we could do about it except, you know, got it wrong. I don't know what else to say. Well, the, the thing about controversial situations and what happens is that you do live with it your whole career. I mean, I made a bad call, a judgment on a holding call, um, and uh, it was uh, it would have given this team a, a first down. Uh, looking at the film afterwards, the ball had already gone past the hold. It was an incorrect call on my part. Uh, turned into a fourth down. They punted the ball to Arian Foster, who ran it back for a touchdown. Damn. Yeah, I lived with it my whole life. That was an incorrect call. But I had a bunch of correct calls and great games and a lot of fun. So you got to keep moving forward through those controversial situations um, and just try to learn from it and be more accurate in your judgment and move forward because you're going to have a ton of success. Um, all right. With that, Zach, thank you so much for what you did tonight. A great review, a great start for our flank officials. Um, be prepared to share any or all of this with your crew as you uh, get prepared for the season. And uh, Zach, you have a great season as well. So congratulations on uh, Big Sky and on behalf of the San Diego County football officials and every 100 people that were over 100 people were on this tonight. Um, thank you very, very much. Yeah, thank you. Glad to be here anytime. Hope it helped. I'm sure the guys appreciate everything. All right, guys. Well, um, you guys have a great evening. And uh, the two clinics coming up after this, we'll do Zoom with John Downing as a back judge. And then the final one, we're going to do a clinic in person at Ma uh, Mira Mesa High School with Scott Campbell. Scott Campbell worked the national championship game as an umpire in the Big 12. And now he's a referee in the Big 12. Uh, he, so he's going to come and talk to referee and umpire and also going to focus on communication with coaches. So you can uh, look forward in your meeting schedule for those clinics. You get credit for all of these. All right. Have a great night, you guys. Thanks so much.